following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. It came to my attention that even though we're gathered for a meditation retreat, that some of you don't know what meditation is. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk about that. Understand something about why we meditate. Why is it important? Why do we always talk about that in this tradition? What is it? What is it not? And also it occurred to me that it might be worth pointing out that in this tradition we don't teach from books as we've, as we've pointed out before and as has been discussed on this retreat. We don't teach from a syllabus or from a pre-arranged or pre-designed plan. In other words, this is not scripted. We teach from our experience. And in our experience, I think that this makes the teaching much more alive, much more vibrant, and much more responsive to the needs of the moment. So, for example, on retreats, we have many practices that we do, and we have lectures that we give, but we don't plan the lectures. We don't plan what's going to happen. And in that way, we are very responsive to the needs of the moment. And that approach is born out of how Gnosis actually works as a living experience. This tradition is not dependent upon a codified system, something that's written down, something that one has to blindly and dogmatically repeat. That is not how spirituality really works. You don't find real spirituality written line by line in a book. And likewise, you don't find it being a spiritual tourist, hopping from school to school or group to group or idea to idea or movement to movement. You don't find spirituality that way. You might be entertained. You might be fascinated by all the things that you'll see and experience with that sort of approach. But you'll never, ever find what real spirituality is. Because real spirituality emerges out of one's heart through experience. And that's found through understanding the science of it. Now, real science, as everyone knows, is proven through experimentation, not through theory. In fact, real science states that nothing should be accepted until it's proven, empirically, fully and completely, without any doubt. Until something is completely and fully proven and repeatable, it should only remain as a theory. Not accepted or rejected, but simply posited as a possibility. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the way science is supposed to work, even though it doesn't really work that way nowadays? Because people just accept science the same way they accept religion. They just believe in it and have never really proven any of it, or very little. So Gnosis really is a science 
in that full and true, genuine meaning. It's a science that one has to approach as a scientist to prove it in one's own experience, to confirm it, to repeat what has been presented, and to confirm for oneself whether it's true or false. Now, from that point of view, we can state without any doubt that none of us are Gnostics. Not a one. We might be interested in Gnosis. We might be curious about Gnosis. We might have spent many years studying Gnosis, so we can be called students of Gnosis. But we cannot be called a true Gnostic until we have proven it. And that proof is not external. It isn't visible to anyone else. It's proof that one has lived in oneself, in one's heart and mind and body. So a real Gnostic is one who has experienced what Jesus taught. And I think if we present it that way, there would be very few who would say, I'm one of those. Now, there would be some who would say that. But would we know if they were telling the truth or lying? No. So it's irrelevant if someone says that or not. From our own point of view, the claims of others mean nothing, truly. Because those claims have no bearing whatsoever on our own soul and the status of our own soul. So to be a Gnostic and to study what Gnosis is are two different things. Gnosis itself, as a word, as a term, really means knowledge. But it means knowledge that one has experienced for oneself. That is, knowledge that one has confirmed. Now, on the most basic level, as we could all presume, all of us have some gnosis of being alive. We can confirm to some degree that we're here and now. We have a physical body. We experience nature. We experience sensations, physically, emotionally, mentally. And that is all a level of gnosis. It is the level of gnosis of an intellectual animal living in a mechanical life. But it's very limited in its reach and its power. And we experience that every day. Because most of what really concerns us, what really affects us, we have no power over. We have very limited power and very limited knowledge. We would love to be able to know what's going to happen later today, tomorrow, next week, next year. All of us have that longing to know, when am I going to die? How long do I have? Where is my true love? What will become of me? What is my purpose? What is my future, my mission? What is my true talent? These are questions that we all have. And having the question implies the existence of an answer. Isn't that true? Isn't it true that if you have a question, it must mean it's answerable? And yet the answer escapes us continually. Whatever pursuits we chase in the material world, whatever religions we follow or beliefs we follow or educations that we chase, still those fundamental questions escape us. We acquire degrees, status, money, power, wealth, fame. Whatever it is that comes to us in this physical world, still the questions remain unanswered. And it's because the tools that we're using to try to answer them are the wrong tools. The answers are not found in books, in beliefs, in so-called masters, not in movements or groups or schools, not in any belief system or theory not in possessions, not in wealth, not in even knowledge, the way we commonly think of knowledge. We spend our day-to-day -day life seeking and seeking and seeking, and all the while, the answer is right here in our own heart. We've just not known how to listen. This is why we learn to meditate. 
to hear the answer. It's quite simple, really, and beautiful. The interesting thing is that the founders of all the religions said the same thing. All of them, in their own words, said the same thing. That the answers to our questions and the solutions to our problems are found in ourselves, in our own hearts. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom. And we know in Hebrew that word kingdom is malkut. which is the physical body. The kingdom of God, where God resides, is within us. And to seek that kingdom, in other words, to gain knowledge of that kingdom, is to acquire knowledge of ourselves. And to see how divinity operates through our own life. So obvious when you see it in that way, that that's what was meant all along, that people always assumed that that kingdom of God is somewhere in the clouds and never knew how to seek for that. Something that is merely theoretical or distant that we can't confirm as real. But you can confirm your physical body is real. And you can confirm it holds many mysteries. And with some effort, you can confirm that your own divinity works through your physical body if you simply pay attention. So meditation as a word encapsulates many things. Unfortunately, in the modern era, this word has become terribly misused and terribly misunderstood. And seems to refer to a whole range of really often silly things. In fact, most people in the West now think that meditation is sitting in a really awkward posture with your fingers touching, sitting on your knees, with your back looking like it's about to break. A very uncomfortable looking position. And they think somehow that that is meditation, to sit that way. Really, that makes no sense. Meditation has nothing to do, really, with a posture. When you understand where the word meditation was translated from in the different languages, and you understand the science that is conveyed through those traditions, you realize that the modern idea of meditation is so far from reality that it's sad. And now we see people talking about meditation on talk shows and on popular books that come out and telling people to do these really superficial and frankly useless types of exercises. And they think that's the extent of meditation. We need to understand that this modern notion of meditation is completely off base. It has no real relationship to the actual meaning, the actual science of meditation. Jesus went into the desert to meditate, to fast, to meditate. He didn't go out there to sit in the desert and put his fingers into a mudra and just space out. That wasn't the purpose. He didn't go out there just to be alone to escape his problems. That isn't the purpose. But people think meditation is an escape. Or they think it's a way to have some sort of psychedelic experience or some super physical sensation. Some kind of incredibly, you know, powerful, overwhelming, pleasant sensation. It's all wrong. None of that has anything to do with meditation. Meditation. 
And when we look at that, and we study that, and we look at the different religions, we realize that really humanity has not understood much at all about its own religions. And that's really sad. Particularly because meditation itself is an art of the soul. It's something expressive and something beautiful. And very few of humanity understand that. Most of humanity is missing one of the most beautiful gifts that God has granted to humanity. And that is the ability to communicate with the divine. And everybody wants that, which is the odd part, the ironic part. Everyone wants to listen to God and talk to God and talk with the angels and masters and Buddhas and have that communication with higher beings. And instead of having the actual communication, people fantasize about it and think that their fantasies are real. And they read books and go to lectures and watch movies and TV shows all about these fantasies about higher beings and masters and all of it is lies. When all the while, the ability to actually talk face to face with an angel or a master or a Buddha is right there in their heart. And they've never learned to use it. For those who study the true science, this is what inspires them to teach. To share that. To give that gift to others so that others can then see, wow, I've been missing this my whole life and I've been carrying it with me all along. So meditation as an art of consciousness is an ancient, precise science. There are many names, many lineages, many ways of talking about it. In the same way that if you go and look at any tree or plant in the garden, there are many names for those trees. Any given tree can have hundreds of different names in different languages. And if the different members of those, those uh, land, you know, cultures and races were to come here and say, that is a such and such tree, and then someone else would say, no, it isn't, that is a such and such, they're both right. They're just using different words. Meditation's the same. It is a tree. And you can talk about it with different words, and you can describe it in different ways, but it is one thing. It is unchanged. It will never change because it describes laws of nature. Those laws don't change. The descriptions change and our understanding of that law can change. But the law itself, the science, the way energies move is always the same, always has been, always will be. Now, when I say art of consciousness, let me explain what art is. Because we also think art is just paintings. But it isn't. In this tradition, we study four pillars. These are four pillars of knowledge. And really, they're all one thing. All the knowledge in the universe is one united knowledge. In the same way we talk about this tree of meditation as a science, as one tree, and we have many names for it, the same is true of all the laws of nature. No matter where you go in the universe, anywhere in this third dimension that you find gravity, you'll find many different names for gravity, but the law of gravity remains the same. And the same is how the air moves and the fire burns and the earth, the earth has its own mechanisms Nature works the way nature works. So knowledge is like that. Knowledge is one universal science. It's true everywhere. But the way we approach it, the way we study it, can vary. We talk about knowledge as having four fundamental aspects. We understand those four really one thing. But to make our little brains understand it a little better, we divide it into four. And those are art, Science, philosophy, religion. Now really, like, it's, like I said, these are one. But we talk about them as four in order for us to sort of comprehend 
because it's a very vast knowledge, vast science. But you see, religion, philosophy, and science, those three encode and explain and describe the laws. They sort of provide a structure. Art is what communicates that. So real art is communication. It's expression. And that can take any number of forms. Painting, when it's conscious painting, when it's real painting, communicates knowledge. So if we study the art, the painting, let's say, of a great master, that painting communicates knowledge to us but will only communicate what we are capable of accessing in it. And that depends on our level of consciousness. So if we study a symphony of Beethoven, and we listen to it in our current state of mind, we will gain whatever we're capable of gaining. But if we awaken consciousness, and we know how to concentrate, and relax, and imagine, and pray, we can extract a lot of knowledge from that symphony. But not with the intellect, with the heart. And the same is true of great paintings. The same is true of great sculptures. The sculptures of the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Aztecs, encode enormous knowledge. But it's knowledge for the heart. It's knowledge that one has to know how to access. So those are art forms that communicate. So meditation is an art of consciousness. It is the way we receive the knowledge that is encoded in those places. And it's the way we receive the knowledge of God. We've already explained to you that by receive, we mean something very specific. We don't mean just the, the sort of superficial level of the word receive. Receive. Like you get a letter in the mail and you've received your check in the mail. That's easy. You don't have to do anything for that, right? It just comes in the mail. But to receive knowledge, especially divine knowledge, higher knowledge, is not as easy as that because of the current state that we are in. Now, if we were the way we should be, it would be very easy to receive it. We would simply look at it and we would get it. But we, unfortunately, over the course of many existences, have damaged ourselves so much that now we look at that art and we don't get anything. We might feel, I know it means something, but I don't know what. Or we get a dream or a vision and we feel, I know there's a meaning there, but I don't know what it is. I had this dream and there were these things that happened and this and this and this and we go to all our friends and our teacher and we go to everybody and talk about our dream but we don't know the meaning. That's because we don't have the art developed in us. We need that. That's why we learn to meditate. Meditation is that way of reception. The way we receive knowledge. Now, these words that I'm using are very specific. They're not accidental. We are very careful with how we use words in this tradition because of the meanings they convey are extremely precise. To receive in Hebrew is kabel, which, of course, is the root of kabbalah. And those of you who have studied with us for some time know that we talk about Kabbalah a lot. And it, that's because Kabbalah is the reception of knowledge, science, philosophy, religion. Kabbalah really is the art of that. When you have some grasp of Kabbalah at whatever level, it helps you to organize and comprehend what you receive. So studying Kabbalah by itself is good. It teaches you many things. 
But when you study Kabbalah alongside developing your meditation practice, that's spirituality. Because the meditation practice is how you open yourself to receive the messages of God. And Kabbalah helps you interpret it. So you need both. There are many who learn to meditate. And they receive visions and they receive messages, but they don't know how to understand them. Conversely, there are many more who study esotericism, religion, philosophy, and they study mysticism. All of the different ways that spirituality and religion and mysticism are available now to humanity. But they don't meditate. They may think they meditate. But if they are not receiving knowledge in meditation, they are not meditating. And thus they remain confused. They have a lot of beautiful theories and beautiful beliefs, but no knowledge. Gnosis. So this is why we meditate and we study Kabbalah. We want to have equilibrium. You see, we all have divinity inside. Divinity is our root. All the scriptures tell us this. That inside of us, all of us has our inner being. The root of our very existence. And our inner being is always attempting to communicate with us. Always. We simply don't listen. We're so caught up in our own mind stream. In our own projections in our mind. That we never listen to what God is saying. To what our inner Buddha is saying. But the messages are there. And every once in a while, we'll remember a dream or we'll have some sort of mystical experience and we will feel very shocked and surprised and maybe upset about it or anxious, maybe excited. And that single experience can be in our memory for years, lifetimes, but we never know the meaning. And we go to every dream dictionary and on the internet trying to find the meaning and we never really understand it. How much better would it be if we had had some understanding when the dream occurred? Because really, messages come in the moment and our guidance. Wouldn't it be better if we were capable of receiving that when it was given? And not only receive it, but understand it. The amazing thing is, that's possible. And everyone here has evidence of that. Your very scriptures that you study are evidence of that. Whoever wrote that scripture received that knowledge from their innermost and wrote it down. The Pistis Sophia was knowledge given and written down. The Bible, the Quran, the sutras, the tantras. All of that was knowledge given, received, written down. Was it interpreted properly? That's another thing. That's something else entirely. All of us have that same capability. Because we have a being inside of us, we have God inside of us. And in that is all the knowledge of the universe. It's simply a matter of learning to access it. So meditation is that science of receiving knowledge. Now, in order to accomplish that, it takes work. It's not an easy thing to do. But the ironic part is that the state of meditation itself is beautifully simple and easy. But getting to it, for us, is not. And the reason for that is because of what we've done to ourselves. Because of the state of our consciousness. And the saddest part is that we are making it worse every day because we stick with our bad habits. So in this tradition, we are intensely psychological because that is the nature of the work. You cannot hope to comprehend your inner being, the nature of life, 
and the answers to all your questions if you do not change how your mind is working. The reason you can't hear the answers now is because of how your mind is functioning. So to get the answers we want, we have to change. And this isn't a superficial change. It isn't a change that you can get by listening to the advice of someone else or reading a book. It's change that you have to recognize in yourself and make it because you want it. And you make it because you know you need it. It's personal. No one can ever tell you, you know what, you need to change A, B, and C. I can see this egos, these egos in you and these defects and you need to change A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you, the whole alphabet. No one can do that because no one can see your mind the way you can see your mind. All that external people can see is the external appearance. So you have to learn to see your mind for what it is. So there are stages to meditation and to the work. They are exact. They are unwavering. They've never changed. They never will change. Meditation is a science, not a theory. Let me state that one more time because it's something that's easily overlooked. Meditation is not a theory. It is proven and has been proven for thousands of years. But you have not proven it yet. For all of us, it remains a theory. Now we need to prove it. We need to test it. We need to work with it. And we need to determine for ourselves what is real, what is true, what is meditation, what is consciousness, what is mind, what is the body, what is emotion, what is thought, what is self. You will face all of those questions when you learn to meditate properly. So let's talk about what meditation is, and then we'll talk about how we get there. I've already hinted that meditation is a way of receiving knowledge. Primarily, it is a way of investigation. So this is directly contradictory to what most people think meditation is. Because most people think meditation is like taking a drug. You take a mushroom, or you take peyote, or you take a drug of some kind, and you have some sort of you know, super physical experience, and you have all these great visions, and you feel awesome, and then you come back and you tell all your friends so they'll feel envious of you, and, and think how cool you are because you took those drugs. They think meditation's like that, and that's not like meditation. It's nothing like meditation. Meditation has nothing to do with that. And there are many people who think, as a side note, that those approaches to spirituality are genuine and will take them to God. And sadly, those people are being deceived. We'll have questions at the end, if you don't mind. Unless I said something wrong. So just hold, save your question. <clears throat> you see, when you look at yourself and you study your mind and you study your experience of life, it isn't hard to confirm that we are trapped in habitual tendencies. Anger, pride, greed, gluttony, laziness, anger, lust. We often don't want to feel those things or act on those things, but we do. We do things and then we realize or we say, that wasn't me. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I felt like that, but that wasn't me. But it was. That conditioned state is precisely the reason why those artificial substances can never take us to divinity. The only way you can reach divinity is to become free of the conditioned state. And no plant or drug 
can free you from yourself, from your ego. Case in point, the alcoholic drinks alcohol to, quote, they tell themselves, escape their problems, right? All the people who are addicted to alcohol run to that substance because they want to break from real life. Real life's too hard. They have too many problems. They have traumas, so they go to drink. And the drink makes them feel euphoric for a time. But then the reality sets in. They become addicted. And the deeper the addiction becomes, the stronger the euphoria, the stronger the dependence, and the stronger the visions. They start to see things. Everyone's heard of this, right? They start to have some other reality that they see. They lose their humanity. Why? What happens? The same is what's happening with the addict of heroin, the user of mushrooms, the user of cocaine, the user of all of these multifarious you know, substances that humanity has somehow discovered without questioning how, where they came from. What is it that occurs? Those substances do awaken consciousness. There's no question about that. They do. But they awaken conditioned consciousness because the consciousness is trapped in all of our mistaken perceptions. You see, the person who drinks alcohol becomes angry. The person who drinks alcohol becomes very sad. They don't become clear-headed. They don't become capable of interpreting scripture. They don't become more beneficial to humanity or themselves. They become sick. Very sick. And it's true in all these cases. So if we back away a little more and look at the groups of people that follow those approaches to spirituality, many, they all claim that the use of the substance that they promote is the way to God. Universally, they all do. There are many who claim that mysticism is alcoholism or that mysticism is to take ayahuasca or yahe or the mushroom or whatever different types of substances. And they have many beautiful theories. And yet when we examine this fundamental scenario, we see there's really a contradiction here. We see two poles, two forces that are opposed to each other. We see those traditions that promote you know, all these Aquarian sort of new age ideas about drug use and sexuality and shamanism and all the things that are mixed up in that. Alcohol and drugs and everything else with that. It's very popular since the 60s. And contrary to that, we see the meditation tradition, which rejects all of that. Any genuine meditation tradition that you study says, you shall not take intoxicants. That's one of the first vows that even a lay person must take. You shall take no intoxicants, no alcohol, no drugs, no nothing. Why? You see this difference. Both claim to reach the same place. Both claim that by following their path, you will receive visions and receive knowledge and receive spiritual development. So if both claim the same thing, how do we know which is true? Naturally, most people think, well, the drug sounds cooler and more fun, so I'm going to go do that. And that's the vast majority of people. They don't investigate those things, even if it's without the spiritual interest. They want to have those visions and those experiences and those sensations to feel good and feel ecstatic. So most people go that way. But... Do we ever find an example of a drunkard saint, a drug addict Buddha? No, not one. Not a single one. 
And yet if we study the lives of the saints, the Buddhas, the masters, every single one of them was a master of meditation. So then we have to look at it another way. Can we find any example of a drunkard demon? Yes, many. A drug addict demon? Many. What about a demon who's a master of meditation? Doubtful. So we need to understand this. And it's important to understand because when we talk about meditation, often we bring with us the education we had from other groups and schools who think that the end result of whatever it is we're pursuing will be some sort of ecstasy, some sort of ecstatic sensation where we will feel like we are merging with the universe and the universe is one and we love all our brothers and sisters and all that other new age stuff. You might have experiences like that, but that's not why we meditate. It has nothing to do with why we meditate. We're not looking for powers. We're not seeking sensations. We're seeking knowledge. What we want is really what all of the people pursuing all these different paths really want, even if they don't recognize it. We want to overcome suffering. And you cannot overcome suffering through any substance, through any physical matter, through any chemical, or any belief or theory. All a chemical can do is produce a sensation which is impermanent. And it can produce consequences that you may not even see. For example, in all the cases of drug use, alcohol, etc., those substances produce dramatic consequences. Firstly, on the physical level, it's quite obvious. They destroy the brain. They destroy the liver. They destroy the heart. They destroy the lungs. This is proven. They can kill you. As a side note, Meditation won't kill you. I know it feels like that sometimes, but you won't die. Not from meditation. So I'm presenting these contrary points of view because many of us carry with us, even if we're not aware of it, these subtle thoughts that perhaps meditation will lead to these types of ecstasies and escape from our problems. And when we sit to meditate, we space out and we sort of lose touch with the world. No, that is not meditation. That's just spacing out. Meditation is the art of receiving knowledge. In other words, it's an art of consciousness. One does not lose consciousness in meditation. One expands it. This is another key point. When you meditate, really meditate, you do not lose consciousness of yourself. You expand consciousness. This is different from what most people think of meditation. So how do we get there? How do we get to that state? How do we experience that? And what's the result of that experience? <laughs> Properly said, meditation is a state of consciousness. Now, the nature of consciousness is to perceive. So meditation is a state of perception. It's a state of perceiving something beyond what we would normally perceive. So this is an important point to understand. It isn't a loss of consciousness. It isn't what you might call an altered state of consciousness. It is rather an expansion of perception. Now, that perception can extend beyond physicality. But it begins here in physicality. Meditation, properly said, has many other terms that refer to it in other traditions. A popular one is samadhi. This term in Sanskrit means to hold unwaveringly. 
to be firm, to be fixed. And that doesn't refer to something rigid. Rather, it refers to something permanent, something that is. Samadhi, in that sense, we can say is like a type of perception that sees reality, that sees past the illusion that we see now. The way we perceive now is filtered. As we've been working with these different practices, we've been talking about how the body works and how the senses work. So that's the first layer of filters that we have to deal with, the senses. We have the five physical senses, which are quite obvious, but which none of us really ever pay attention to. Most of the time, we're just caught up in the drama of our thinking. Very rarely are we fully aware of what we're perceiving through our five senses, physically speaking. And yet, everything we experience is filtered by those senses. This is why in most traditions, the beginners start with that, learning how to be a watcher of the senses. Krishna talks about this in the Bhagavad Gita in a very beautiful way. And as I mentioned previously, Asian philosophy and mysticism says that there are not just these five physical senses, there's a sixth one, which is the ability to be aware of the mind. In the same way that we see through our eyes and ears, and we perceive through our tongue and nose and skin, we also sense thought and emotion. So that is the sixth sense to sense thinking and feeling. Now, that part, even though we're not really aware of how we do it, we're generally caught up in that thinking and feeling. Whatever's going on with us physically, externally, really, we're not that aware of the senses physically. We're more caught up in this drama of what's happening in the mind in relation to what's happening in our perceptions of the external world. So we're going from room to room and conversation to conversation. We hear the words that are said and we're reacting in our minds and thinking of what to say. And that whole exchange is happening so quickly, we're not really aware of it. We don't really perceive all the energetic transformations that happen there or the consequences of those transformations. And yet that's precisely what has created the mind that we have now. We see a person, we make an immediate valuation of that person, we've built an entire profile of that person in our mind, we assume they are a certain way, we hear a certain word from them, we interpret it according to that profile without any awareness that we're doing that all the time. We judge people like that, we judge ourselves like that, we judge everything like that in relation with our desires. So you see how complex things have already become? We've only been talking about this a few minutes. And when you really observe yourself, you discover how complicated this process really is. It's complicated. So how do we get to this point? Because we don't pay attention. We're just reacting and reacting and reacting. Not cognizant of what we think and feel and sense. So we start training, learning to watch the senses, learning to expand awareness, learning to be here and now, learning to be present, learning to observe the three brains, the body, the heart, the intellect. And in that observation, we start to receive. Really, truly, this is the beginning of meditation. We're not even in the meditation hall. We're not sitting on our cushion or at home in our quiet room with our candle burning. We're at work, we're at school, we're with our friends, with our spouse, our parents, observing our three brains receiving all the impressions through our six senses. 
and digesting them right there, understanding them right there, receiving that impression and responding consciously rather than mechanically. This creates a fundamental change in not only our experience of life, but our experience as a being, as a person. You see the practices we did that when we sat outside and we worked with the five senses, how different we felt. Totally different kind of energy simply from paying attention. If we learn to apply that in our daily lives, when we eat our meals, when we walk to work, we ride in the car, everything we do, when we take that same approach of receiving consciously, we feel different. And the consequences are different. In our normal day to day life, we get home from work or school and we feel exhausted and we feel overwhelmed and we have so many residual bubbling thoughts and worries and anxieties, unresolved problems. When we approach life in this way, cognizantly with awareness, that changes. Because when we go through life mechanically, all those impressions come into us mechanically and get stuck in the mind. And when we were angry with someone, that anger just ferments in our mind and heart. And we think about that anger and we feel that anger and it just ferments and gets darker and richer. But when you've received that impression of whatever might have irritated you in former days and you receive it consciously and you transform that impression, and you realize this person that's angry or saying a hard for word, really, they're just in pain. I don't need to be angry with them. Really, I feel compassion for them because they're suffering. And we're no longer angry. Then when we go home, that anger isn't there bothering us. Simple example, but makes a big difference. Because these are piled on top of each other, layer after layer after layer. Piles and piles and piles of untransformed impressions. So when we go to meditate, in our current state, having had lifetimes of improperly transforming impressions, we now look inside of our mind and we see an absolute chaos. The mind will not sit still. It's like a raging sea. And we feel frustrated, disappointed, defeated, and feel like meditation is impossible. And this is what most people experience, and they walk away. The vast majority of people who want to try to learn meditation give up immediately. And they blame the meditation tradition. They say, oh, that school is no good. That teacher is no good. That teaching doesn't work. It's too hard. I want something easier. Give me a drug. Let me buy a pill that will awaken my consciousness. Let me go pay some shaman some money and he'll awaken my consciousness for me. That's what we think. Meditation is work because we have to fix the problems that we've created. You see, our body digests food on its own. Our lungs digest the air on its own. But our mind cannot transform impressions on its own because our consciousness is asleep. If we awaken our consciousness and keep it awakened, we start to digest impressions. That means that the information that comes in is digested. We take from it what is important and useful and we throw out the remainder. This is how we acquire information. Right away, just from observing ourselves, we start to learn. Learn about ourselves, learn about others. Going deeper, once we've established that continuity of awareness, we start to meditate at home. That continuity of awareness is what allows us to go deeper in meditation. We take the same exact skill, a continuity of concentration, of observation, except we close all the senses and we observe with only the sixth one. We shut down the body and all the five senses and instead, we simply observe the mind. It's the exact same process. It's the exact same tool. 
We're just applying it in a specific way. Does that make sense? It's not complicated. So you see, during the day, you were using all your senses and observing everything very consciously. This is harder because you've got to observe six senses. Meditation's easier. You only have to observe one. Why are we saying meditation is harder? Interesting, isn't it? We're saying meditation is harder because we're not really doing all six during the day. If we do that all day, meditation is easy. We've been preparing for meditation all day long. So then when we go to meditate, easier. Turn the five senses off. Focus on the one. So this is the very first aspect to understand about the process of meditation. That's a simple, practical outline of how it works. Now, what happens when you actually do this? When you go to meditate and you shut off those five external senses and you're only observing the one interior sense, well, this is where the magic begins. This is where you start to discover who you really are. You start to realize that you are not the body. That you as a soul exists separate from the body and can function separate from the body even better than while in the body. In this way, we see that consciousness is beyond the body and beyond the senses. So when we meditate, we forget the body. Now notice a difference here. During the day and during preliminary types of exercises, we work to really be aware of being in the body. And then when we go to sit to meditate, we forget it. This is very different. If in your meditation you are still focused on your body, you will become stagnant as a meditator. Now, there are preliminary practices, like observing the breath, working with certain vowels and mantras, other types of techniques, like the, like the runes. You're working very much with the body, to be aware of the body. But when you want to comprehend something, when you want to meditate on something, you have to forget the body. You have to abandon it. Why? Well, the consciousness doesn't belong to the body. The body is just a suit, like clothes that we wear. Every living being is like that, multidimensional. All of these plants and animals that are outside, all of them leave their bodies at will. For them, there's no confusion about that because they're awake. For us, being so asleep and, and attached to materialism, we don't understand that we are not separate from the body. When you learn to meditate, you will learn about this, that the consciousness is not the body. It is separate. Now, many students come to meditation schools and they want to learn how to have ecstatic experiences. And often they've heard about astral projection or mental projection. And they want to know, how can I go out into these other dimensions and experience these other dimensions? And they always kind of point over there. How can I go out over there? How can I experience that place that's somewhere, somewhere up there? How can I see the elementals? How can I experience the angels? Where are the Buddhas? Are they over there somewhere? In Nirvana, in some other place? Let's understand something clearly so that we can understand meditation properly. All of the dimensions are right here and now. We just don't see them. They aren't somewhere else. Students in this tradition learn about the physical body and it has a superior component, which is its energy. And the energy of the physical body is called the vital body. 
And that exists in the fourth dimension. So then people think, oh, the fourth dimension must be up there somewhere. No, it's not. It's right here. It is the very energy of your physical body. You can feel your physical body, right? You can sense it. And you can feel its relative degree of energy. Now, obviously, you have energy to be awake. So we're all awake to some degree right now. And there's energy moving in us. That is the energy of the vital body. It's right here. And then students hear about the astral body, which is more subtle in the fifth dimension. And all the students are very interested in the astral body and want to know, how can I travel in my astral body? Where is it? I want to experience my astral body. If you are here and now, fully and completely, your astral body is also here and now. Because the astral body is your body of emotion. It is emotion. That energy, that is your astral body. It isn't somewhere else. It's right here. If you are here and now. And the same is true of the mental body. If you are here and now, and your mind is focused on this topic, not distracted, but here and now, then your mental body is also here and now. But if during the course of this discussion, your mind wanders and you start remembering, oh, in the kitchen I left something out and it's on the counter and I, need to go, I really need to call somebody, your mental body just left and went home and is in your kitchen trying to figure out how to put that physical bowl back in the refrigerator. Interesting, isn't it? That's how this works. When you're distracted, you are disjointed. That's why we emphasize be here and now in all three brains. Be in your body. Concentrate. Relax. This way we become integrated. Now in meditation, this is even more essential. Because if you want to experience meditation and gain knowledge from your being, it's impossible if you are not integrated. And this is the problem that most meditators have. We sit to meditate and we start chanting our mantra, but our mind is at work. The physical body is saying om, 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 but the mind is tapping at the computer at work and thinking about that coworker who's so evil. And the heart is thinking maybe that handsome young man down the aisle will come and say hi to me today. Or maybe that pretty girl will respond to me saying hi to her. Meanwhile, the physical body is there saying, om, om, om. We're not integrated. And yet we're longing for some experience in the astral world when we're already busy in the astral world. We sent our astral body off chasing some fantasy about some other person. We can't have an experience with God like that. It isn't possible. We can't comprehend a scripture or receive knowledge or understand the Kabbalah, when the different parts of ourselves are in all different places. It isn't possible. Fundamental, number one, first thing, be integrated. Be here and now. That's why we emphasize it. Now, I'm explaining it in this way because there's a transition that has to happen here. And I want, it to make, I want it to be clear for you so you can understand this. Physically speaking, when you go through your day, you have to be in a state of being here and now. We call that self-observation, self-remembering. To remember that you're here in the body. To observe oneself. To be aware. This is to be integrated. To not be distracted. To not be fantasizing. But to be here and now completely. And then when we start our meditation practice, we need to start in that same manner. 
to be fully here and now. Why? Well, I partly explained that already, which is that if our heart and mind are elsewhere, we can't be integrated in order to accomplish our goal. But let's explore why that is. Let's fully explore that and understand that. Because all of us want to have knowledge and we want to understand these other dimensions and we want to experience the astral and mental world and causal world. We want to all experience the absolute and all the things we talk about in Kabbalah. But we don't. And it's precisely because of this exact transition, this precise balancing of forces in meditation, of being integrated, of being concentrated, and knowing how to utilize imagination effectively. You see, when you're distracted, fantasizing, you're using your imagination, but mechanically. So you're there in meditation and you're hungry and you're only thinking about what's going to be for dinner. So in your mind, you have these images of the food you would like to have. So you're not integrated. You're using your fantasy to build that image in your imagination. If on the other hand, you knew to be fully present and integrated, to be in that meditation practice, relaxed, prayerful, concentrated, and you were imagining what you're meditating on, you could enter into that consciously and leave your body and go into the astral world consciously, awake. That isn't hard. Every plant and every animal all around us, they do that all the time. Babies do that all the time. Easy. It's natural. It's normal. We can't do it because we're disjointed. Because we're asleep. Because we have so many conflicting desires and wills in us that we can't even integrate ourselves for those few minutes to produce that. But the actual exit out of the body, very simple. It's natural. It's a, it's a law of nature. It happens on its own. If the forces are balanced in just the right way, it happens on its own. There's no force involved. It's like if you pour a glass of water, the water pours out onto the ground. In the same way, if your consciousness is in exactly the right position, it will leave the body. It just goes out. And you do this every time you fall asleep. We're just not aware of it because we're so distracted when we fall asleep. We're dreaming, we're fantasizing. We're caught up in that dialogue in the mind. And so we're not aware of when that transition occurs. But it happens to us every day. So let's state that once more with clarity. The transition that you want to reach in meditation, you already know how to do it. You do it every day when you fall asleep. All you have to learn is to do it consciously. That's why we sit upright in meditation. So we can keep a little bit of wakefulness. You'll notice if you lie down to do this, you'll have some cognizance for a little while, but then the dreaming will overwhelm you and you're asleep. And then suddenly you wake up back on the floor or on your bed, wondering what happened. Maybe a few memories of dreams, but no cognizance. But when you learn to meditate properly, you learn to go out of the body consciously. So that's why I'm saying it's simple, because it's natural, it's normal. What's abnormal is the state of our minds. And if we keep putting foreign substances into our minds, chemicals, drugs, bad impressions, bad energies, bad thinking, bad action, we make it worse. If we keep saturating our consciousness with negativity, we only trap it further. We enslave it. Meditation really is about liberating ourselves from that cage. So that's how meditation works in simple terms. Really, meditation is about gaining clarity 
and perception. Now, in practical terms, what does that mean? Let's put a practical example. <clears throat> Let's say you've had a bad experience with some person. They've hurt you. And you feel a lot of resentment. And no matter what you do, you can't seem to deal with it. That resentment is very strong. And you find yourself thinking about that person in a harmful way, a negative way. Naturally, if you just go about things in a mechanical form, that will never be resolved. And you will carry that anger with you forever. Even if it becomes less uh, of an influence in your moment-to-moment -moment life, it will nevertheless remain in your subconsciousness because it was unresolved. If, on the other hand, you decide you want to apply these tools to deal with that resentment, and you, start, you say, I'm going to meditate on this. I really want to understand this. I want to change this quality. I want to understand this resentment and, and not feel that way. So you would apply these principles. Firstly, of course, you would have to be managing your daily life with watchfulness, with wakefulness. You would also have to be transmuting your energy, saving your energy, not wasting it through foolishness, like sexual escapades, like abusing chemicals or any other type of bad behaviors that can harm you physically or emotionally or mentally. And of course, you'd have to be adopting this meditation practice. So each night you would come home and you would reflect on your experiences of the day, but then you always have that resentment that's bothering you and you see, wow, all day long I just kept thinking about this person and really so angry. So you would visualize that. You would relax. You would pray for help to whatever divinity you want to pray to. Ultimately, what matters there is the prayer, is the attitude of the heart. And then you would start to relax deep into your meditation and you would concentrate on the facts. Now, it may be that you want to concentrate on the thoughts and feelings you had that specific day. It may be that you want to meditate on the event that started it all. Either way, you would visualize the facts of what happened. Not what you thought happened. Not what you were told happened. But what actually happened. Now, sometimes we get mad because we were told something happened. And if that's the case, we would meditate on the person telling us that. So see what I'm pointing out is you have to meditate on the facts, not what the mind thinks, not speculations, not wondering, maybe it was like this and maybe it was like that and maybe they didn't mean to do this. It's not like that at all. You meditate on the exact facts of what happened. And in that, you're visualizing that event. You're picturing it, you're imagining it, and you're getting drowsy. And you're praying, and you're concentrating, and you're getting drowsy. More and more relaxed, more and more concentrated. In other words, you abandon the physical senses completely. You're only using that sixth sense, which is to be aware of the mind. To be aware of what's going on in your psyche. The body is forgotten. The body is there in the posture you chose. It is relaxed. It is basically going to take a nap. And that's essentially the type of relaxation you want. So in observing that event, the facts of it, you visualize that. And you can be praying at the same time. You're visualizing. You can even use a mantra. You can even use a pranayama to feed yourself energy. There are different ways to utilize this, but the fundamental basis is to visualize. And as you do so, <clears throat> and as you relax, you're approaching that same doorway that you approach when you go to sleep. But you're doing it consciously, and you're doing it holding an image, an event, a factual thing that happened that you want to understand. And if you can manage 
that combination of things in a delicate balance, all of a sudden, your inner senses will open. And you will see that event more real than it happened physically. Now, normally when we imagine something, that vision is not very clear, right? So if for right now we were to say, let's all imagine an apple. You can imagine an apple, even with your eyes open, you can imagine an, an apple in your mind, right? Everybody can do that? That is that imagination that we're talking about. That's what we're going to use in meditation. That same exact ability. It doesn't take force. If I ask you to imagine the shoes that you were wearing or to imagine what your room looks like that you're staying in now or you were to imagine the food that you just ate for your last meal, all those images come easily, naturally. That's how we use imagination in our practice. It isn't the type of thing where you have to clench your eyes and clench your fist and force it. It isn't like that. It's very relaxed, natural. But that is very still somewhat hazy, isn't it? That image might appear and then it goes away. So if I say, imagine a monkey, you get that little picture and then it's gone. And if the little effort, you can sort of keep the image of the monkey somewhere up here, monkey picture, but not so easy to sustain. As you develop your meditation practice, that skill becomes much more vibrant. It starts to become more solid, more real, more consistent, it lasts longer. It's normal, it's natural. There's nothing spectacular, it is nothing shocking, it is nothing surprising, it is nothing supernatural because the nature of the consciousness is to perceive. So in your meditation practice, gradually, you will start to perceive. Sometimes it's lights, sometimes it's obscure visions, partial things, letters, symbols, often doesn't make any sense. But in this tradition, we focus very strongly on developing imagination because that's how we reach comprehension. We utilize the natural powers of the consciousness to understand things. So in the example I gave, we were exusing an event in our life that we want to understand. And we visualize that. And at first, it's hard to see it. It's hard to remember it. And as we're trying to remember it, the mind is saying, no, it wasn't like that. It didn't happen like that. The mind tries to change it. Anyone experienced that? You're trying to remember and meditate on something that happened and your mind's always saying, no, 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 no. It was much worse than that. Our mind likes to be dramatic. Our ego, rather. So we emphasize to stick with the facts. Little by little, as you work with that, the ability to visualize becomes stronger, more clear, and lasts longer. Until eventually... You close your eyes, you see. You sit to meditate, you close your eyes, the image appears easily. And then you visualize that and you work with that. At that point, you're no longer projecting an image. In the same way that I said, imagine a monkey and you call up an image of a monkey and it just appears there. Gradually, you no longer need that. You simply close your eyes and you see. Now this is an important point to make because the imagination is a polarity as well. One thing is to project fantasy, to project images from our own will, and another is to receive them. But that's a topic of another lecture. The point is, that is the transition in which we start to receive genuine knowledge. And that knowledge is not coming from the physical world and it's not coming from your brain. It's coming from the internal worlds. Now the difficulty is our own internal worlds are very corrupted because they are our own mind. So we cannot trust what we see. 
especially in the beginning, especially in the middle, and even at the end. Because the ego also works with these images. The ego also tries to communicate through visions, through dreams. The ego also wants to satisfy its desires and can easily trick us. So having visions and having insight and having clairvoyance is good, it's normal, it's natural, it's needed, but it's also very easy to be deceived through those skills. So just because you start to see things, don't feel special, because even a badger can see images with his imagination. Even a rat. It doesn't make us special. It just means we're starting to recover what we lost. Now, at that juncture where we start to see things, that's really where the work begins. It's at that point that we can really start to investigate the ego and investigate ourselves and really investigate anything that is of concern to us. It's at that point that we can really start to comprehend and understand the nature of suffering. That's the point. It's to understand how we made this mess and how to fix it. So in the example we gave, there are many types of knowledge that could come out of that. We were meditating on that event of resentment and anger, and we might perceive in that vision that the other person didn't intend to hurt us. Maybe it was a misunderstanding completely. Or maybe it was a recurrence of some kind. That was a kind of karma that we had to pass through. Or maybe there was some other reason that we don't know. We think we know everything, but we never do. There's a lot of information we don't have about things that we're very much concerned with. And if we knew everything, we would feel very differently. So it's good to remember we don't know everything especially when you're transforming impressions. So in simple terms, even though it's probably not that simple, that's more or less what we meditate for. It's to acquire comprehension, to start to understand ourselves. And in that way, we can start to behave better and understand each other better and become better people. This same tool is what we use to meditate on the scriptures, to meditate on dreams, so, for example, you may have had some dream and then you know it's full of significance, but you can't resolve the meaning. No book can give you the real meaning because your inner divinity doesn't read that book. Your inner divinity uses symbols to communicate. That's the language of the internal world. So to understand those symbols, you have to go there and meditate on that to understand that. So you would meditate on that dream. And no, you're not going to have God come down and say, okay, here's what your dream meant. Firstly, the color red meant this and that. That's not what's going to happen. Instead, your being is going to give you another symbol. And then another symbol. And little by little, you start to understand them. It's a beautiful language. It's much better than English. It's much deeper and richer and much more profound. And it can never be written down. As beautiful as any languages in the physical world, none of them compare to the language of God. Just think about that. How does a God communicate? And how are you going to understand that? Not with English, and not with French or Spanish. Instead, you have to learn that language, and that language is Kabbalah. You can call it other names, but it's the same language. It's symbolic. So, all of us who study spirituality are interested in dreams and the meanings of dreams, and we're interested in the astral world and astral projection. And understanding of all of those things is in Kabbalah. Because that is the language of those worlds. 
and to understand them, we meditate. So to use a similar example, you've had a dream, you would then meditate, you would visualize that dream. You'd have to relax, forget the physical world completely. Concentrate on remembering exactly the image you saw in your dream. Visualize that. Pray. Relax. Concentrate. Visualize. Relax. Pray. Little by little, as you sink in and start to approach that door between wakefulness and sleep, that's where that vision, the insight can occur. Anyone notice that when you start falling asleep, that you start seeing visions? That's the door to samadhi. So let me give you a hint, a clue. Every single morning when you wake up in your bed, work with this because you're right at the door. You just came out of it. So turn around and look back through it. Don't move. As soon as you become aware that you're in your bed, then you realize, oh, okay, here I am. I just came out of that state. I want to learn about that. So let me turn back around and recover a little bit of that drowsiness. Let me meditate. Let me visualize the dream I had or the event that I had that's bothering me. Let me comprehend this thing that I need to understand. In that instant, you were right at the door and in the perfect place to get more knowledge. Your body's already perfect, relaxed. You already don't care about the physical world at all. You've got just the right amount of drowsiness. And this happens to you every single day. So take advantage of that. So any questions? I have an uh, observation, comment, or question. Uh, observation, comment is, um, I've listened to your series, Meditation Without Exertion. <coughs> found it to be extremely useful for the first time I truly understood why moral discipline is critical to the meditation practice. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, observation. I've had experiences with uh, <coughs> theogens. I've traveled down to Peru and I've been to Costa Rica and I believe there is some usefulness to these tools to have to clear out certain space within our mind and our subconscious. And I, I know personal examples didn't ever apply to me. I've worked with different religions. I don't know. I'm testing the problem. I know people who have personally um, overcame very serious addiction. Having said all that, doesn't mean they're not here. It's, it's really useful to me. It's like the last time I drank, I lost that. It became very clear to me that, okay, now it's time to move on. You graduated from kindergarten, literally. Right? My question to you is in the Gnostic tradition, is there a concept similar to enlightenment that you apply and say that that's a Buddhist tradition? I know you're well versed in that. So, are there any correspondences or are they different? Um, uh, is there, I presume there's some commonality there, but uh, what would distinguish it from anything? Okay, so the word enlightenment. Mm -hmm. In Tibetan Buddhism specifically, that word is used in a variety of ways, but it's also not conveyed well in translation. So the word enlightenment uh, in the most uh, sort of crude sense means comprehension. So you can read some stories about uh, teachers or students who received a lesson and the, the scripture says, and such and such found enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So most readers think, oh, well, that student who was just a student all of a sudden became a completely realized Buddha in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's not the meaning. It means that that student gained comprehension. Enlighten means to have light. And isn't that true? When we get an idea, it's like the light bulb goes on over our head. Bing! That's enlightenment. It's when we have an understanding of something, a sudden breakthrough of some degree. In Tibetan Buddhism, that's the meaning that's implied. And in classical Buddhism as well. But again, that gets misunderstood and mistranslated in different traditions. So what, that, what I'm saying is that there are two fundamental forms of enlightenment. There's the temporary or uh, transient type of enlightenment, which is like that. It's a sudden understanding or a sudden realization. 
But when we mean enlightenment as full enlightenment, that means that one has completed the path. That's only done when one has paid all of one's karma. So we're using that word enlightenment in different ways in those traditions. Now in the Gnostic tradition, we use the same terms. And in the same ways sometimes. And in Zen, you find the same, just as a note. But typically in, in Gnosticism, what we mean by the, the temporary or transient enlightenment, we usually use the word comprehension or understanding or realization. That's a, a word that you find in Hinduism that means the same thing. They'll say, suddenly he, he reached realization. And the students think, oh, the guy became a complete, fully developed being in that instant, which is, by the way, impossible. It's like saying the tree sprang into complete development from a seed in an instant. That doesn't happen in anything in nature. Full realization, full liberation, full enlightenment are synonymous terms. And in this tradition, we call that resurrection. To be a resurrected master is to be fully enlightened. That is to be at the level of Jesus, Buddha, Moses, Krishna, very high. But along the way to that, there are many realizations, many enlightenments, many liberations, but they are in levels. But the full and complete development very difficult to reach. Good question. More questions? Yes. Um, you know, like, what is the difference between, or is one better or worse in um, consciously suffering in order or not, and feeling that we're gaining experience and knowledge because we're conscious of the order? Real comprehension is something that's known only in the heart. It's something that's intuitive. It's a type of enlightenment. It's a flash of knowing. To develop and receive full comprehension of something, you must be meditating regularly. But it doesn't mean that your comprehension will only come during meditation. In the same way that when you get a sudden idea about a job you have to do, you're not only going to get that idea at work. You might get it when you're cooking your dinner at home. And then you realize, oh, yeah, this is a great solution for that problem, right? The same happens with comprehension. We meditate every day, but sometimes the solution or the understanding comes at odd moments. It suddenly appears in the heart. Oh, now I get it. Does that make sense? To really get comprehension, you have to be meditating. And when you say meditating, you mean sitting still? I mean meditating. I mean actively pursuing the science of meditation. Not just doing vowels or mantras, but actually trying to utilize the consciousness to understand things. It doesn't always involve leaving the body. So that's a good point, though. I'm glad you mentioned that. What I was trying to explain here is something that can come of it. You can leave your body and get more knowledge. But comprehension itself can occur at any time. But it will be a result of the work you've been doing with your consciousness. Always. Yeah, absolutely. Working through the body to sort of work through storms that are manifesting physically, and then once that happens, it can make. So, is it? Can you say it's sort of it's a we go between the body and the and kind of mind in the meditation to make that that is the science of going. Is the science going between the two, or is it between the impermanent and the physical? The science is to become integrated. So to integrate. It's to become integrated. So. Um, 
to become integrated. So whatever our circumstances and whatever we're passing through, we need to be working with consciousness. And ultimately, we need to be understanding that the consciousness is not limited to the body. And we need to be seeking to understand that more. And I put it that way because it's often easy to feel like, well, I'm not capable of experiencing the astral world, or I'm not capable of astral projection, or I'm not capable of samadhi. So I'm just going to sit and observe my breath. And many people resign themselves to practices like that, or like you mentioned, the Vipassana techniques. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But it's self-defeatist. Some people who think of that in that way, really, they're saying, I'm not even going to try to comprehend or to go out of my body. I'm just going to leave myself in my little scenario of pain and suffer through it. But that isn't necessary. It's a choice that that person has made. I'm not saying that's your case, but that can happen. Exactly. Well, awakening, awakening is something that has to happen from moment to moment. It's not a gift that's given. It's a process. As we experienced when we went outside and worked with our senses today, and as you experience when you work with concentration practice and you work with self-observation practice, you yourself provoke changes simply by how you pay attention. That is what provokes awakening. It doesn't come as a gift. It doesn't come as a boon from God. Now, in Hinduism, many people look at it that way. They think you only are awakened when the, when the guru comes and gives you that. That's a very common understanding, and unfortunately, it's not true. Awakening is not like that. And if you study the real, the real masters of Hinduism, they all say it. But the followers don't want to work. You know, they don't want to do the work. They just want someone to come and give it to them. It's like the Christians thinking if they just say they believe in Jesus, they'll be saved. But it doesn't work like that. Awakening is a process. And we are the ones who produce that through our moment-to-moment -moment wakefulness. Yeah. And meditation is just an extension of that. It's all it is. It isn't separate from it. It's an extension of it. So if someone is not making the effort to awaken on a continual basis, whether they try to meditate or not is irrelevant. It won't make any difference. It won't do anything for them. And that's why we see many students of meditation who may try and try and try but never get anywhere and give up because they don't understand that meditation is simply an extension of your all-day-long effort to be here and now. Now, critical to that, we've explained repeatedly about being here and now and being present and being watchful. And today I started to hint at something in addition to that. Because simply being here now and being watchful doesn't help a whole lot when you're getting really angry at somebody or someone's getting really angry at you. Because then you're just being aware of being angry. And that doesn't do much good. We also have to transform our experiences. We have to transform impressions. And that's an additional step. We're trying to break it into simple steps so everyone can understand, but in the experience, there is no difference. When you're really observing yourself and you're really remembering yourself and you encounter, you come home from your job and your spouse is there enraged because you didn't do something, it's very easy to forget yourself and jump right into that argument and match that anger. Anyone who's married knows this. <laughs> In an instant, you can lose the entire day's work. It's another thing entirely 
to open that door and have all that anger come at you like a wave and receive it with gratitude and with a smile and with love and with sweetness. And that is to transform that impression. Not easy, but that's what we need to do. So it's not enough just to be aware and say, I'm aware that she's yelling at me and I'm aware that she's enraged against me. It's not enough. We have to receive that and digest that and respond to it with virtue. Not with anger, with love. That is to transform that. And that's a lot of energy to manage, particularly with anger, with lust, with envy, with gluttony, with greed, all of these things. Not easy. Now, I mention it in this way specifically because a lot of students hear about self-observation, self-remembering, and try to learn that and develop some facility with that but don't go the extra step of learning to transform impressions. So instead, we go through our day-to-day -day existence, being enmeshed in our egos and the reactions to the other people and not making the effort to change. Sure, we're aware, we're watchful, but not changing. So mere watchfulness is not enough. It's just the first part. It's the first part we have to learn. But the next part is we have to transform impressions. What does that mean? In practical terms, it means whatever happens, don't become identified. Don't lose your watchfulness. And learn to respond virtuously to everything. Now, the only way you can do that is if you are very aware of your own egotistical nature. So let's give an example of that. You have heard that someone's spreading rumors about you. That someone's talking about you. Some kind of gossip. And they're going around and they're telling such and such a person and such and such a person, oh, she's really bad. You should stay away from her. You should stay away from her. She's bad news. She did this and she did that and she said these things. Really, man... Get out while you can. So she hears that. And what's the reaction going to be? Obviously, she's going to be hurt. She's going to be angry. She's going to be afraid because her relationship could be in danger. Many types of reactions can emerge from all that. Depending on her own idiosyncrasy and the nature of her own personality, she'll respond mechanically. But if she knows how to transform impressions, if she knows that this type of thing will definitely stimulate her ego, then her reaction is going to be, okay, I see my anger. I see my pride. I feel that. And I feel my fear. And I feel, my react I feel these reactions in my heart. And I see these thoughts coming. I need to meditate. Before I say anything to anyone, I need to meditate. So the immediate understanding in that person is that they are aware that their own ego has been stimulated. And if they're not careful, it will react and make the situation worse. So inside them, they feel the boiling of all that emotion and the surging of all the thinking and the impulses in the body to go and slap somebody around or tell somebody the real story or say, you guys are lying. You shouldn't have said it. It wasn't like this and this and this. And they want to go out in the world and fix all the circumstances. That's the mechanical reaction. And it's an egotistical reaction. The conscious reaction is to meditate. And the conscious reaction is to meditate on the facts of what happened. A rumor. Somebody said to somebody else, maybe. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I didn't hear it. I was told, and somebody told somebody, and somebody told somebody. Who knows what really happened? So why does it bother me? And anyway, why do I care what those people think? We have to analyze in that way. Digest it. Why does this bother me? What does it stimulate? Why do I care? The only reason something like that would bother us is if we put value in it. 
if you don't care what somebody thinks, then you don't care what they say. But if you do care, then why? So these are things that we have to analyze and investigate. The main point is one has to assume in any circumstance, when you feel something and you sense something, it is your ego. And this is completely opposite of our normal reaction. When somebody does something, we always blame them. But let me tell you something. From the point of view of Gnosis, anytime you feel angry, you are wrong. Because anger is a demon. Anger is demonic. It is. And your mind will justify it and justify it and say, yeah, but you did this and you did that. And you have all these reasons and it doesn't matter. Because from the point of view of your being, that anger is a demon. And if you choose to empower it, that's your choice. But you will suffer the consequences. So the transformation of impressions is intimately associated with this type of analysis. Where everything we experience, we have to analyze it in contrast to what the being is. And when we feel lust and we feel anger, we feel fear, we feel resentment and pride and all of those things, we have to always look at it from the point of view of no matter what anybody else outside of me has done or said or not done, my experience is due to my own nature. And my nature is corrupted. So anything that happens, I take responsibility. When I come home and my wife's enraged and she's yelling, it's my fault that I feel angry or I feel hurt or I feel resentful. Not hers. I really should feel bad that she's enraged. I should feel sad, not angry in return. Not proud, justifying myself. No, you're wrong, and this and that. I should feel her pain because I love her. If I see her anger, anger is painful. It isn't pleasant. I should feel like, oh, she's in pain. Not feel angry. That's all transforming impressions. It's turning it around on oneself. No matter what anyone does to you, you have to turn it around. Only give out love to others, patience to others, charity to others, kindness to others, never blaming, never criticizing, never judging, judging only oneself, no matter what anyone does. Now, this is something I very much admire about certain Asian lineages. that this quality is so much in some cultures in Asia. Actually, you find it in the Americas as well, but it's not as common now. It's so integral in the culture to never speak poorly of anyone. And I respect that so much because it's not like that in the West at all. We love to talk bad about other people. And we can do it all day long and never get tired of it. Even directly to someone's face, we like to point out the things that hurt them. We like to make jokes about each other and point out things and tease each other. But at the base of it, it's hurtful. And it's part of our culture. And it's a shame. So any other questions? Okay. 
Let me, let me repeat again that the, the gateway that I'm describing is a gateway that we call samadhi, and that is not necessary for comprehension itself. It is a way to access very deep comprehension of things. But real comprehension occurs in the heart, and comprehension begins the instant you begin observing yourself. The instant you start to see the reality of your mind, and you start to see the reality of your situation, you start to comprehend. I mean, seriously, when you start meditating, and you start trying to <laughs> relax and say, okay, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna have a calm mind. <clears throat> I'm gonna sit to meditate, my mind's gonna be silent, and you realize that you can't <laughs> get that. And your mind's a chaos. And immediately you say, wow, my mind is a mess. That's comprehension. Not a deep one, but it is a comprehension. It's an understanding. You've seen something that's true and real. And the same is true with analysis, even on the intellectual level. You can ana analyze a situation and see, yeah, okay, I understand that that triggered my pride and my pride is involved, okay. That's good. But the test of it is, if a similar situation happens and you react the same way, then you know that you didn't really comprehend because the reaction is still there. Even if you don't act on it externally, if you feel it, then the ego is still there. So the comprehension has to be deeper. Many people in, in different types of traditions think that they can just analyze the ego. They can make diagrams on paper or whatever and sort of structure it out. And that is comprehension. And it isn't. It's just a diagram. Comprehension is proven when our behavior changes. The ego is deep in the mind. And every defect is different. Every psychological behavior is different. Some are shallow. Most are, have some depth to them. So to penetrate into those depths, we need meditation. And this is precisely the reason we teach meditation the way that we do. If you're simply learning meditation and you're able to get into a state where you have sufficient concentration to visualize an event that you want to meditate on and hold that event and not forget you're meditating, you are capable of comprehending a great deal about yourself. You just need patience. For that, you just need to be able to sit, observe that scene, and reflect on it, and just sit with it. You can't force comprehension. It comes intuitively and spontaneously on its own. And part of the process of that is to not have expectations. Anyone who's doing this work knows you come home, you review the occurrences of the day, and you can find 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 things that you want to meditate on. So you sit to meditate and you put five minutes onto a certain event and 10 minutes onto another event and 10 minutes onto another event and then that's it. And you feel like, well, I didn't get anything. Some people just give up because they're expecting that all of a sudden they're going to go out of their body and have these experiences and it's not like that. Comprehension is a slow process in which the consciousness gradually penetrates into things. So Little by little, what you're creating is a dynamic energy in the soul. That dynamic energy doesn't begin or end in your meditation practice. Your meditation practice is only part of that dynamic process. Your whole day long process of observing yourself is part of that, and so is your process of being asleep at night. Your life becomes a dynamic. All the pieces of what you're doing, your transmutation, your runes, your mantras, your meditation, your self-observation, is all part of one thing. And that's why if you're engaged in that process and you're observing events during the day and you're meditating on, on them in the evening and you're doing your practices when you can, suddenly, in the shower, you get it. You get, oh, suddenly I realized it was like this and I, was, I can't believe that this was the thing. And just... Simple, so obvious. And that's how comprehension can emerge. But it only happens if that whole dynamic is in play. It makes sense? Yeah. But the full, so, so in essence, that you don't necessarily need to enter samadhi to fully comprehend that. Eventually, to go deeper, to you go do. Deeper.
Right. Now, let me, let me give another piece of this puzzle that, because this is a big thing that we're trying to encapsulate in a <coughs> short talk. There's another piece of this that I, let me address quickly, and that is, in all of these things that we're trying to learn about ourselves, the only way we're really going to understand the nature of the mind and the nature of the ego is if we also understand virtue. You know, in the example of the gossip that's spreading around, what would be the virtuous way to respond to that? And most of us don't know. Or what would be the virtuous way to respond if someone is, you know, saying these really hurtful things about us at work or at our church or whatever place, and we're hearing these things about ourselves that people are saying? What would be, I mean, the, the mechanical response would be to get angry and go in there and try to set everybody straight. But what would be the virtuous response? <laughs> It might. It depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. But whatever the case, we have to meditate on that. In our own scenario, in our own scene, what is the virtuous thing to do? Sometimes it's simply to walk away. Sometimes you just can't fix other people. You just can't. Those people are like that? Okay. You can go be like that. Just don't have anything to do with them. Sometimes that's the right response. Sometimes you need to deal with them. If it's your family or someone close to you, you, you need to figure out a way to deal with them virtuously. That's a great question. It's very relevant. So I had given in a previous lecture an example of a time when I was really wanting to have a type of spiritual experience. I wanted to be out of my body and, and experience something with that, but I wasn't able to. And, is, and your question is, is that somehow different from meditation, that type of experience or... Okay. Like, of course, I have some points that I can mention. Of sure. Yeah, I understand. And would that, that be a spiritual experience or just... Because you mentioned that the, the ultimate idea of meditating is acquiring knowledge. And so I felt that I received the knowledge, but I wasn't sure that it qualified as knowledge. For example, I felt compassion for everything, for everyone. Yeah, of course that counts. Absolutely. Because it's not something egotistical. It's a sensation that you, you just, uh, how do you say, emerge? Mm -hmm. You felt the oneness of things. Yes. Yeah. So there was no me. Right. And so that's the thing. Is it a spiritual experience? Of course, maybe it is. But is that real meditation again? Real meditation, as I said in this discussion, is to acquire knowledge. Now, we acquire knowledge all the time in many different ways. And, but the type of knowledge that we're referring to is the type of knowledge we can't acquire through a, a book or some other type of process. We mean the type of knowledge that it relates to the soul, experiential knowledge related to the soul. So in that context, you can understand that when you meditate properly, you can acquire knowledge without leaving your body. As long as your consciousness is awake and is active and is actively opening itself and receptive to receiving that type of knowledge, it can receive it. And it can be as simple as an intuitive grasp of something, an understanding. Simply to say, oh yeah, now I get it. And to the intellect, it seems silly, right? And to us, we think that doesn't have any value. 
to have an intuitive understanding. But that's much more valuable than an intellectual idea. Because when you understand something, you have peace. And that's what we want. Yeah, the sensations are really irrelevant. Exactly. The sensations come and go. It's that you know it now because you experienced it. Right. Yeah, it's not the sensation, it's the understanding. That's what matters. So, I, I, I'm sorry if it was confusing in the way I presented it. What I was trying to show is that along the way of the process of learning to meditate, eventually you reach that point where you can leave the body in order to go into deeper levels of the mind. But that's down the road. What we need to do for now is work where we are to expand our awareness and to learn more about where we are now and to learn to meditate. And little by little, that process unfolds naturally in us. But along the way, as we meditate and we reflect, we utilize the consciousness, we acquire a great deal of knowledge about ourselves and about life. We acquire serenity, which is hugely valuable. Don't make your spiritual pursuit one that, where you're chasing after sensations or experiences because you will be disappointed. Unfortunately, many people do that. Right. And I remember that you said that the most, one of the most important things is to pray to your mother. And that was my, one of my main focuses. And when I surrendered to her, she heard me. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. And after the experience, it was so clear to me that the moment that I lost it, when I was like, I'm so afraid that I'm never going to have this experience, that I'm going to be like crying, crying, crying life after life and not having it. And then in that moment when I just surrendered to her, it just came like boom. Like no problem. Because I was honest that I had this fear. Often that's what it takes is for us to fully and completely face the obstacle. And of course I did the other steps too, like Pranayama and so on. But that was like she was waiting for me to ask her. Yeah, and see, that's a comprehension as well. So you had in that both an experience and a comprehension. And that's good. That's very valuable. But that won't happen every day. Exactly. Yeah. But it helped me to realize that it's real and that it's like I'm, 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 I'm not doubting anymore. That that's great. It actually happened. That's really valuable, too. That's what I needed. Like, the portal to open. Good. Yeah. What is the creative? It's exactly what we're discussing. Yeah, because in, by creative, he's implying utilizing the creative energy. And it's the consciousness that harnesses that. So through our process of transmutation, we charge up the consciousness. And that's what gives us light to see internally. And when we utilize that to focus that energy on ourselves and reflecting upon ourselves, it is creative in that way. It creates comprehension. Yeah. I think we've gone over our time a little bit, right? It's okay? Oh, so we just keep going? You can take another question. Oh. Is there another question? So you mean the difference between repressing yeah. or, or reacting with? Certain, um, 
sensing that uh, ignoring is not uh, solving. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a difference. Repression is not an answer in any case. To ignore something or to repress a reaction is not an answer. So, like an example, you come home to an angry spouse, ignoring them is not going to make it better. <laughs> I can guarantee you that it doesn't work. Each problem that we face has an answer. This is a key thing. It's really important to grasp this. But the problem is we never see it. And that's because we become identified with our own perception. So in the case of this anger example, all of these qualities are very infectious. So when we come to this angry person and all this anger is blasted at us, it is very easy to be infected with that same anger and respond with that same anger. Some of us internalize that and we respond with indifference, coldness, and that's how we express anger. We may not yell and scream, we just become a block of ice, but it's still anger. And so that ignoring can be very painful to ourselves and to others. The real uh, process of transforming impressions is knowing how to respond with a virtue, how to respond properly in any given scenario. And ultimately what that means is that we have to understand the point of view of the other. The way that you overcome anger is with sweetness. And it's sometimes very difficult to be sweet when somebody is angry at you. But that's the way. And the way to overcome envy is happiness for that person. So if you feel or sense envy in yourself and you're really struggling, like this person has the job I wanted and they got the raise I wanted and they've got the house that I feel I should have and all the things that I should have, the good spouse or whatever it is that we want for ourselves, we have to learn instead to say and, and experience and feel really happy for them. <clears throat> really contemplate that they need that. It's like we were talking about the other day. We have to love the Lord thy God with all of our mind and heart and strength and soul and the neighbor as ourself. And when we really apply that, that's a way of transforming impressions. So that means that in any scenario, we can't repress things, avoid things, or indulge in them. We have to be in the middle, comprehending, understanding. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.